Hello guys and gals, and this is part 13 of our reading of The Last Unicorn by Peter Beagle. In the last episode, uh, we found out more about Prince Lear, and about these different feats that he went through in order to try and win Lady Amalthea, the human embodiment of the unicorn. And, um... There was some cat there that I still don't understand what it what it's doing there, but anyways... Because cats aren't exactly allowed in the castle, and I don't know. So I'm kind of confused by that, but we'll find out. Currently, Molly is talking to the four hired men-at-arms, and they're all like 70 years old. And she's asking them why they stick around if, um, you know, Hagger doesn't really treat them very well. And we're going to find out what the third man's, the third men-at-arms, third soldier's um, answer is. So far, the first two have been, oh, I'm too old. But anyways, so here we go. The third man said, Haggard is older than we are. In time, Prince Lear will be king in this country, and I will not leave the world. I will not leave the world until I have seen that day. I ha have always been fond of the boy since he was small. Molly found that she was not hungry. She looked around at the faces of the old men and listened to the so to the sounds their steamy lips and shuriken throats made as they drank her soup. And she was suddenly glad that King Haggard always had his meals alone. Molly inevitably came to care for anyone she fed. Cautiously, she asked them, Have you ever heard the tale of Prince Lear? Have you ever heard the tale that Prince Lear is not Hag is not Haggard's adopted nephew at all? The men at arms showed no surprise at the question. I, the eldest, replied, We know that story. It may well be true, for the prince certainly bears no family resemblance to the king, but what of it? Better a, t a stolen stranger rule ruling the land than the true son of King Haggard. But if the prince was stolen from ha from Hagsgate, Molly cried, then he is the man who will make the who will make the curse on the castle come true and she repeated the rhyme that the man dren had recited at the inn in, in hagsgate yet none but one of hagsgate town may bring the castle swirling down but the old men shook their heads gr grinning with teeth as rusty as their casks and corselets not Prince Lear, the third man said. The prince may slay a thousand dragons, but he will level no castle, overthrow no king. It is not in his nature. He is a dutiful son who seeks, alas, only to be worthy of the man he calls his father. Not Prince Lear, the rhyme must speak of some other. And even if Prince Lear were the one, the second man replied, even if the curse has marked him for its messenger, still he would fail, for between King Haggard and any doom stands the Red Bull. A silence sprang into the room and stood there, darkening the faces with its savage shadow and chilling the good hot soup with its with its breath. The little <coughs> excuse me. The little autumn cat stopped purring on Molly's lap, and the thin cooking fire cowered down. The cold scullery walls seemed to draw closer together. The fourth man at arms, who had not spoken before, called across the dark, across the dark to Molly Grew. There is the true reason that we stay in Haggard's employ. He does not wish us to leave, and what King Haggard wishes or does not wish is the on, is the only concern. only concern of the Red Bull. We are Haggard's minions, but we are the Red Bull's prisoners. Molly's hands were steady as she st stroked the cat, but her voice was pinched and dry when she spoke. What is the Red Bull to King Haggard? It was the oldest man at arms that answered. We do not know. The bull has always been here. It serves Haggard as his army and his bulwark. It is his strength 
and the source of his strength, and it must be his one companion as well, for I am sure he descends to its lair betimes downstairs some secret stairway. Oh, this, this seems important, so I'm going to read this again. It serves Haggard as his army and his bulwark. It is his strength and the source of his strength. And it must be his one companion as well, for I am sure he descends to its lair betimes. Down some secret stair, but whether it obeys Haggard from choice or compulsion, and whether the bull or the king is the master, that we have never known. The fourth man, who was the youngest, leaned towards Molly Group. His pink, wet eyes suddenly eager, he said, The red bull is a demon, and its reckoning for for attending Haggard will one day be Haggard himself. Another man interrupted him, insisting that the cle- the clearest evidence showed that the bull was King Haggard's enchanted slave, and would be until it broke the be- the bewitchment that held it and destroyed its former lord. They began to shout and spill their soup. But Molly asked not loudly, but in a way that made them all be still. Do you know what a unicorn is? Have you ever seen one? Of everything alive in the little room, only the cat and the silence seemed to look back at her with any understanding. The four men blinked and belched and rubbed their eyes, deep, restless, and sleeping. Oh, deep, restless, the sleeping bull stirred again. The meal being over, the men-at-arms saluted Molly Grew and left the scullery, two for their beds, two to take up their nightly vigil in the rain, the oldest of the men waiting until the others were gone before he said quietly to Molly, Be careful of the Lady Amalthea. When she first came here, her beauty was such that even the accursed castle became beautiful, too. Like the moon, which is only a shining stone, but... She has been here too long. Now she is a beautiful. Now she is as beautiful as ever. But the rooms and roofs that contain her are somewhat meaner for her presence. He gave a long sigh, which frayed into a whine. I am familiar with that kind of beauty, he said. But I had never said. I've never seen that other sort before. Be careful of her. She should go away from here. Alone, Molly put her face in the little cat's random fur. The cooking fire fluttered low, but she did not get up to feed to feed it. Small, swift creatures scurried a- across the room, making a sound like King Haggard's voice. And the rain rumbled against the castle walls, sounding like the Red Bull. Then, as though in answer, she heard the bull. His bellow shattered the stones under her feet, and she clutched desperately at the table to keep herself and the cat from plunging down to him. She cried out, and the cat said, He is going out. He's go- he goes out every sundown to hunt for the strange white beast that escaped him. You know that perfectly well. Don't be stupid. The hungering roar came again further away. Molly caught her breath and stared at the little cat. She was not as amazed as another night, as another might have been. These days, she was harder to surprise than most women. Could you always talk? She asked the cat. Or was it the sight of Lady Amalthea that gave you speech? The cat licked a front paw reflectively. It was the sight of her that made me feel like talking, he said at length. And let us leave it at that. So, that is a unicorn. She is very beautiful. How do you know she is a unicorn, Molly demanded. And why were you afraid to let her touch you? I saw that you were afraid of her. I doubt that I will feel like talking for very long, the cat replied, with, without rancor. I would not waste time in foolishness if I were you. As to your first question, no cat out of first fur can ever be deceived by appearances. Unlike human beings who enjoy them, as as for your second question, here he faltered and suddenly became very interested in washing. 
nor would he speak until he had licked himself fluffy and then licked himself smooth again. Even then, he would not look at Molly, but examined his claws. If she, is t if she had touched me, he said very softly, I would have been hers, and not my own, not ever again. I wanted her to touch me, but I could not let her. No cat will. We let human beings caress us because it is pleasant enough and calms them, but not her. The price is more than a cat can pay. Molly picked him up, and he purred into her neck for such a long while that she began to fear that his moment of speech had passed, but presently he said, You have very little time. Soon she will no longer remember who she is or why she came to this place, and the Red Bull will no longer roar in the night for her. It may be that she will marry the good prince who loves her. The cat pushed his head hard into Molly's su suddenly still hand. Do that, he commanded. The prince is very brave to love a unicorn. A cat, a cat can appreciate valiant absurdity. No, Molly Grew said. No, that cannot be. She is the last. Well, then, she must do what she came to do, the cat replied. She must take the king's way down to the bowl. Molly held him so fiercely that he gave a mouse-like squeak of protest. Do you know the way, she asked, as eagerly as Prince Lear had demanded of her. Tell me the way. Tell me where we must go. She put the cat down on the table and took her hand her hands off him. The cat made no answer for a long time, but his eyes grew brighter and brighter, gold shivering down to cover the green. His cro his crooked ear twitched and the black tips of his the black tip of his tail and nothing more. When the wine drinks itself, he said, when the skull speaks, when the clock strikes then the right time, only then will you find the tunnel that leads to the Red Bull's lair. He tucked his paws under his chest and added, There is a trick to it, of course. I'll bet, Molly said grimly. There is a horrible, crumbling old skull stuck up high on a pillar in the great hall, but it hasn't had anything to say for some time. The clock that stands n nearby is mad and strikes when it pleases. Midnight every hour, seventeen o'clock at four, or perhaps, or perhaps not a sound for a week, and the wine. Oh, cat! Wouldn't it be simpler just to show me this? Show me the tunnel. You know where it is, don't you? Of course I know," answered the cat with a glinting, curling yawn. "Of course, it would be simpler for me to show you. Save a lot of time and trouble." His voice was becoming a sleepy draw, and Molly realized that. Like King Haggard himself, he was losing interest. Quickly she asked him, Tell me one thing, then. What became of the unicorns? Where are they? The cat yawned again. Near and far, far and near, he mused. He, oh, he murmured. They are within sight of your lady's eyes, but almost out of reach of her memory. They are coming closer, and they are getting, and they are going away. He closed his eyes. Molly's breath came like, like rope fretting against her harsh her harsh throat. Darn you! Why won't you help me? she cried. Why must you always speak in riddles? One eye opened slowly, green and gold as sunlight, in the woods. The cat said, I am, I am what I am. I would tell you what you want to know if I could, for you have been kind to me. But I am a cat, and no cat anywhere ever gave anyone a straight answer. His last few words drowsed away into a deep into a deep regular purr, and he was asleep. With the one eye partly open, Molly held him on her lap and stroked him, and he purred in his sleep, but he did not speak again. We are to chapter 11. Prince Lear came home three days after he set out to slay the maiden fancying odor, uh, ogre, uh, with the great axe of Duke Albin slung behind him and the ogre's head bumping at his saddle bow. He offered neither prize to Lady Amalthea, nor did he rush to find her with the monster's blood still brown on his hands. He had made up his mind 
as he explained to Molly Grew in the scullery that evening, never more to trouble the Lady Amalthea with his attentions, but to live quietly in the thought of her, serving her ardently until his lonely death, but seeking neither her company nor admiration nor her love. I will be as anonymous as the air she breathes, he said, as invisible as the force that holds her on the earth. Thinking about it for a little, while, for a little he added, I may write a poem for her now and then and slip it under her door or just leave it somewhere for her to chance upon, but I won't even sign the poems. It is very noble, Molly said. She felt relieved that the prince was giving up his courtship and amused as well and somewhat sad. Girls like poems better than dead dragons and magic swords, she offered. I, all, I always did anyways when I was a girl. The reason I ran off with Collie, but Prince Lear interrupted her, saying firmly, No, do not give, give me hope. I must learn to live without hope, as my father does, and perhaps we will understand each other at last. He dug into his pocket, and Molly heard paper crackling. Actually, I've already written a few poems about it. Hope and her, and so on. You might look them over if you want, if you wanted to. I'd be, I'd be very pleased, Molly said, but will you never go out again then to fight more black knights and ride through rings of fire? The words were meant teasingly, but she found, as she spoke, that she would have been a little sorry if it were, if it were so, for his adventures had made him much handsomer and taken off a lot of weight and given him and given him besides a hint of the musky fragrance of death that clings to all heroes but the prince shook his head looking almost embarrassed um okay Oh, I suppose I'll keep my hand in, he murdered, he muttered, but it wouldn't be for the for the show of it, or for her to find out. It would like oh it would it was like that at first, but you get into the habit of of rescuing people, breaking enchantments, challenging the wicked Duke in fair combat. It's hard to give up being a hero once you get used to it. Do you like the first poem? It certainly has a lot of feeling, she said. Can you really rhyme bloomed with ruined? It, need, it needs a bit of smoothing out, Prince Lear admitted. Miracle, miracle, uh, miracle, the word I'm worried about. I was wondering about grackle myself. No, the spelling is, no, the spelling is it. One R or two is two L's or the other way around. One R, anyway, I think, Molly said. Smendrick, for the magician, had just stopped... Oh. One R, anyways, I think, Molly said. Smendrick, for the magician, had just stepped through the doorway. How many R's in Miracle? Two. He answered wearily. It, it, was, it has the same root as mirror. Molly ladled him out a bowl of broth, and he sat down at the table. His eyes were hard and cloudy as jade, and one of the lids was twitching. I can't do this very much longer, he said slowly. It isn't this horrible place, and it isn't this horrible place, and it isn't having to be listening for him all the time. I'm getting rather good at that. It's the wretched cheap jack flummery he has me performing for him hours on end all night last night i wouldn't mind if he had asked for the real magic or even the simple conjuring but it's always the rings and the goldfish and the cards and the scarves and the strings exactly as it was the midnight carnival i can't do it not much more but that was what he wanted you for molly protested if he wanted real magic he'd have kept the old magician the that Maybrook. Smidrick raised his head and gave her a look that was almost amusing. I didn't mean it like that, she said. Besides, it's only a little while until we find the way to the Red Bull, and the cat told me about. 
She lowered her voice to a whisper as she spoke. This last... This last. And both of them glanced quickly over at Prince Lear, but he was sitting on a stool in the corner, evidently writing another poem. Gazelle, he muttered, tapping his pen against his lips. Demoiselle, uh, Citadel, Asphodel, Philomel, Parallel. He chose farewell and scribbled rapidly. We will never find the way, Smendrick said very quietly. Even if the cat told you the truth, which I doubt, Haggard will make sure we never have time to investigate the skull and the clock. Why do you suppose he piles more work on you every day? If not... Uh, to keep you from prowling and prying into the great hall. Why do you think he keeps me entertaining him with my carnival tricks? Why do you think he took me as his wizard in the first place? Molly, he knows, I'm sure of it. He knows why, he knows what she is, though he doesn't quite believe it yet. But when he does, he'll know what to do. He knows. I see it in his face sometimes. The lift of longing and the crash of loss... Prince Lear said, the bitterness of Trump, Trumpty, Trumptyas, cross, boss, moss, darn. Spendrick leaned across the table. We can't stay here and wait for him to strike. Then our only hope is that we have is to escape at night, by sea perhaps. If I can lay a hold of a boat somewhere, the minute arms will look the other way and the gate. But the other, she cried softly, how can we leave? leave when she has come so far to find the other unicorns and we know they are here yet one small tender treacherous part of her was suddenly eager to be convinced of the quest failure and she knew it and was angry at Smendrick well but what about your magic she asked what about your own little search are you going to give are you going to give that up too Will she die in human shape and and you live forever? You might as well let the bull have her then. The magician sank, sank back, his face gone pale and crumpled as a washerwoman's fingers. It doesn't really matter one way or the other, he said almost to himself. She's no unicorn now, but a mor but a mortal woman. Someone for someone for that long for that lout to sigh over and write poems about. Maybe Haggard won't find out, find her out after all. She'll be his daughter, and he'll never know. That's funny. He put his soup aside, unfastened, and leaned his head into his hands. I, I couldn't change her back into a unicorn if we. I I couldn't change her back into a unicorn if we did find the others. He said, "There's no magic in me." Spendrick, she began, but at the moment he jumped to his feet and rushed out of the scullery. Though she had not heard the king summon him, Prince Lear never looked up, but went on drumming meters and sampling rhymes. Molly hung a kettle over the fire for the century's tea. Give me just a sec here. So, she's making the sentries tea. That's nice of her. Um, I've got it all but the final couplet, Lear said presently. Do you want to hear it now, or would you rather not rather wait? Whichever you like, she said. Or so he read it then, but she never heard a word of it. Fortunately, the minute arms came in before he had finished reading, and he was too shy to ask her opinion in their presence. But... By the time they left, he was working on something else, and it was very late. When he had, he bade her good night. Molly was sitting at the table, holding her, her motley cat. The new poem was meant to be uh, Sestina, and Prince Lear's head was jangling happily as he juggled the end words on his way up the stairs to his chamber. I will leave the first one at her door, he thought, and save the others until tomorrow. He was debating his original decision against signing his work and playing with such pen names as 
the Night of the Shadows, and La Chevalier Melami. And he turned a corner and met the Lady Amalthea. She was coming, uh, coming down quickly in the dark, and when she saw him, she made a strange bleeding sound and stood still three steps above him. She, was, she wore a robe that one of the king's men had stolen for her in Hagsgate. Her hair was down and her feet were bare. And the sight of her on the stairs sent such sorrow licking along Prince Lear's bones that he dropped all that she that he dropped his poems and his pretense together and actually turned to run. But he was a hero in all ways, and he turned bravely back to face her, saying in a calm and courtly manner, Give you good evening, my lady. The lady Amalthea stared at him through the gloom, putting out a hand, but drawing it back before she touched him. Who are you? she whispered. Are you Rook? I'm Lear, he answered, suddenly frightened. Don't you know me? But she backed away, and it seemed to the prince that her steps were like were as flowing as an animal's, and that she even lowered her head in the way of a goat or of a deer. He said, I'm Lear. The old woman said, said the Lady Amalthea, the moon went out. Ah! She, shiv she shivered once, and then her eyes recognized him, but all her body was still wild and watchful, and she came no nearer to him. You are dreaming, my lady, he said, finding nightly speech again. I would that I might know your dream. We are going to stop it right here on page 121. We only have about 48 pages left to go, and we are making good time in this. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, darn. Okay, I think I probably... Okay. Anyways, we have been reading from the, the Last Unicorn by Peter Beagle, and um, we are getting done. We're getting close to the end now. Um, if you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so, no one, so you know when I upload. And if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the, in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.